In today's episode, I speak to Lisa Hagar about influence and how to live for the crazy. With many HR professionals losing their jobs, there is a need for them to be able to stand up from the others and demonstrate why they are the best talent for the role. Lisa and I discuss the idea that the key skill of HR needs to be influence and the avoidance of being a busy fool. And Lisa goes on to talk about how she became a big influence on LinkedIn and how others can emulate that success. Her ability to push her network enabled her to secure a new HR position and Lisa's new company approached her on LinkedIn because they were able to resonate with what she was saying. Lisa is a maverick and lives for the crazy. She's not afraid of change. Also in the conversation, I talk about how I've helped teams to be not just change ready, but to become change hungry. This is a fantastic conversation about change, influence and the need to be relevant. Listen up to the rest of the conversation. Before we begin our conversation, here is a quick shout out to the Pathologically Curious. Check out the Maverick Paradox magazine. It's a digital magazine written by Mavericks for business owners and professionals. You can find the magazine at themaverickparadox.com. The magazine's aim is to provoke Maverick leadership everywhere. Welcome to the Maverick Paradox podcast, where we explore what it is to be a Maverick and discover effective modes of leadership. I am Judith Germain, and my mission is to propel the Maverick mindset into a world where character and integrity will ultimately have a higher premium than personality and bureaucracy. So thank you for joining me on this journey. If you would like to continue with me, then please subscribe to my podcast on iTunes, Stitcher or one of the other popular podcast platforms. And today our guest is Lisa Hagar. Hi, Lisa. Good morning, Judith. How are you? I'm doing really well. I'm extremely excited to be speaking to you today because I sense a kindred spirit. (laughs) Yes, I think we're going to get on like a house on fire. I think we're very aligned on on very passionate about the topics for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so before before we start into our conversation, tell us about you. Oh gosh, do you know when people ask you that? I've obviously recently gone through a number of interviews where people say, "Tell me about yourself." And the one thing I'm actually not very good at doing is telling people about me because most of my career and my life, I ask people about them. So when people turn around and ask me about me, I kind of go oh um right what would what, what, what do you want to hear uh, and I just think that's really funny about based on you know the role that oh, I do um yes yeah, so I have been uh, in HR for almost 30 years um and I, I've loved my career you know I started off in, in admin and then grew my career to a group HR director um mostly focused in scale up and startup businesses because I like the pace, I like the agility, um, I live for the crazy, um, but it's allowed me to understand the business as well as all the moving parts. And I think, um, you know, in HR, you can specialise. But for me, I like the generalist of of getting my hands busy on all parts. So um, it's, you know, it's what I do. It's what I love. It's who I am. Um, And I do a number of, you know, volunteering uh, with charities. I'm a huge advocate of mental health charities that I'm supporting right now. Um, I do, you know, I have a a coaching business and an online business as well and a referrals business. So I'm, although um, HR is my first and always will be primary love, um, I still have an awful lot of other stuff going on as well. So um, I'm not going to use the word entrepreneur because I don't like it, but um, (laughs) I'm a HR professional and a business person. That's how I would describe myself. That's fantastic. And that probably explains why you understand the world of work in terms of not just the HR because you're running your own business as well. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good comment. And yes, I've definitely learned a lot. Um, and I've learned from some of the most, you know, the best people. Uh, some of the CEOs I've worked with have been incredible. Um, and, uh, you know, unofficial or official mentors. Um, and yeah, where I haven't known something, I've just gone and said, how do you do that? How do you get to that conclusion? Why did you get to that conclusion? How does that work? Um, and, and whilst I know I've been at a pain in people's butts at times, um, I've used it every learning opportunity where it's presented itself um, and got involved. Because I think people know by now I'm not shy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's good. What I think is interesting, um, certainly when I was director in HR, I noticed that a lot of my 
HR colleagues only understood HR. They didn't actually understand the business that they were in, i.e. the industry that they were in, but also they were unable to add to the function. So if there was a marketing issue, they didn't understand marketing, so they couldn't support, or if there was a ops issue, they couldn't understand that. Do you think it's really important for HR to get the business that they're in, as well as the industry, or do you think it's, it's more important to just stay focused on the HR elements? Um, yeah, I think if anybody is serious, see, it depends on the organisation. Uh, let's let's be, you know, let's get really sort of very real and blunt here. Um, some organisations encompass HR into their leadership and understand um, how it fits in to part of the puzzle and are engaging in getting people from HR involved in, in all aspects. Um, and some aren't. And so it depends on the culture of the company, because if you're, you know, let's let's face it, we've all been in companies where you're a transactional department. You are where people go for tea and cuddles when they're upset and nobody knows what to do with people. Uh, you're the admin department and you're the department that people send people to if they've been naughty of any kind. It's like, oh, that's, that's you know, um, they're not performing very well rather than the line manager deal. Oh, it's now HR's problem. And so so depending on the organisation depends what you can do whilst you're in there. It, it, I think that's a, a very you know key point to make because what we're not saying here is every HR person has the opportunity to get involved in the business because for some people it's very segregated. My honest answer is then if you're serious about your career, you need to move from where you are. But, you know, I won't go and have a mass <laughs> exodus on my hand from that comment. But you know what I mean? So um, but for some people, it's a very transactional role. Um, and But, you know, you and I have, have the school where we say, we can add so much more value by not being that and actually by putting in efficiencies in things like policies and processes, which we know we have to have, they should only be 20 percent of the role. And the other 80 percent should be adding commercial value, whether, um, you know, regardless of what that may be, but adding commercial value, which you know adds to the bottom line and then stops that you know, that kind of label that we've got, which says HRs are draw on the bottom line. They're yeah. not fee earners. They're not fee generators. Therefore, you know, they're a nice to have, but they're not essential. Um, so, again, it depends on the mindset of the company and the, the leaders and the board that run it. Yeah, and I think I think the only thing that you've left out there is the ability to influence from the HR person. Yes, yeah. As well. I and that's probably the one key skill um, mm. I say to people. It's the... You know, yes, go in. Um, and even if they don't invite you to, to meetings, just ask. Yeah. You know, what's the worst they could say is, no, I don't think it's appropriate for you to sit in this meeting. And then I go, well, why? Why well, that exactly? Right. <laughs> and, then, and you say, and like, oh, OK, you can come. <laughs> yeah, because like, HR, we don't really want to say no. We don't really want to wind her up. So uh, I go, oh, I, I might have seen her. Just listen and learn. And then they go, um, oh, uh, okay. And then by that time, you're half walked in the room. You're there anyway. Um, so yeah, it's just so... about you to add value. I mean, like I used to say to my teams, like you go to a new organisation and you traditionally you'd go in. It's a kind of transactional HR. And I would say to the team, okay, there are some things on HR that's a cycle. You know, you have to recruit at a certain point. You know, you've got to pay people at a certain point. And all this mm -hmm. stuff. But you make that cycle lean so that you've got time to spend on the other stuff that's important. Um, yeah, and it's about understanding what is important because we can all be busy fools and um, spend many hours doing lots of things that um, – that you know need doing um and we have this endless list of um you know this to-do list that's got 55 things on it every day um and i said to people well are they critical you know get your top five do your most important thing of the day and make that your priority um because we can all be busy doing things that actually when you think about it they're not adding any value. They're just things that people need doing. It's like, well, if they're not adding value and you can't measure them, so you can't see if, if they're successful, then what's the point of doing them? Put them in a bit and start again. And my huge thing of that is the handbook. And I know people will harpoon me for saying this, <laughs> but I think you should get the handbook and I think you should put the handbook in the bin <laughs> because it stops a conversation. And at the end of the day, we work with people, do this. That's where our passion lies. So if somebody yeah. wants to know something, I get it's not very efficient to keep asking HR, how many days holiday have I got? Or can I do this? So you're going to have a portal where there's some obvious, you know, FAQ sort of, you know, people can refer to, of course. 
um, but not in the form of a handbook. And then if somebody has a bit more of a interesting conversation to have, um, do you know what? Take five minutes of the day and answer them because that's engagement. Um, and what people don't realize is the psychology of making that person feel wanted, needed, included and respected means they're going to stay with you. And who wants to lose the best talent just because you haven't found the time for people? Um, exactly. I mean, it's yeah. that kind of conversation around what is it that you're trying to achieve? And then you have a discussion around that. And then if need be, you can say, you know, well, this is what the policy is. But you don't start off with the policy is this. You start off with what do you want to achieve? You know, yeah. so, totally get that. What I, find, what I find fascinating when we talked about influence um, and the need for HR to be influential is that you are very influential. Um, I, can, I can imagine you're very influential inside work because I can see that you're an influ influencer outside of work, um, especially on LinkedIn. How did that happen? Did you plan it or did it just happen by accident? Um. Part and part, if I'm really honest, um, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm a, a LinkedIn guru or a LinkedIn <laughs> coach by any stretch of the imagination. But it was a purposeful move. Yes. So um, what I wanted was for a number of things, really. It started out when I lost my job a few years ago after being made redundant, that um, networking was the way forward rather than and a bit like a, recently after I'd lost my job recently with COVID. It, the same approach really was um, I've got a huge network and at the time I didn't obviously start off with a huge network but it was very okay who do I want to be connected with so I haven't gone and randomly clicked on you know 20,000 people and said you know be my friend um, mm -hmm. everybody in my network makes sense to me um, because I wanted to build something that meant something that was purposeful from people that I could learn that they would write articles and blogs that I could read and go, that's really interesting. And actually, I disagree. Let's have a conversation about that and actually take some learning from that. So it was my own personal development that was the reason I started it, because I wanted to learn from bigger and better, uh, as I still do. And, and I love that. I still like to challenge my brain a lot. So that's actually where it started. Um, and what I found as time had gone on is most of the people I connected with, uh, very few people actually post and very few people engage with other people's posts. They maybe do not like, but they do it from behind a curtain. And so that part of, uh, well, why, why do you stay in the shadows? And then I looked at it and it was actually more HR people stay in the shadows. They'll read, but they won't engage or, or you know, the DMs would light up with, a, oh, I don't want to say this publicly. But and then I would say to people, well, why not? Why are you afraid of having a voice? And it came down to two things. One, I'm not confident about doing it in public in case people judge me. And the other was, well, what if my employer sees it and they don't like what I've written? Well, and again, I would say to people, well, there's two things again, which is, well, one, you're allowed to have a voice as long as it's not, you know, you're not treating anybody to anything that's detrimental. If you can agree or disagree with something, um, as long as it's, you know, professionally done and throw a bit of humour in there, because at the end of the day, we are people. And I know that there's the whole thing about, you know, this isn't Facebook. No, it isn't Facebook. But the same way as we are human beings and we have a personality and people resonate with a personality. So the reason why I think I've been successful on this is because they start to know me and I'm cheeky and naughty and a little bit sass. And I'm vocal. I'm vocal in a space where very few people are vocal because they're afraid, whereas I'm not. Um, and if I post something, I read back and then go, well, actually, do you know what? Judith, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, that came out of my head and it came down on paper and it wasn't quite the same thing as a translated, you know, when you read it back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've all done it. And you just pull it back. You just pull it off and you go, yeah, that's not quite as I planned. Um, so um, and, and of course, I've had some that have had great responses and. You know, and I've had some that have had uh, a lot of responses, but a lot of them have been very negative to the point where I've had to pull a few people off and said enough um, because people can have a view. But when that person starts to attack another person's view, that's not that's not conducive to what it's about. Um, so I will take control of that and either tell them to step down or tell them to delete it or they get blocked. So I manage that. Um, and so it's not that I expect everybody to be happy clapping and agree with everybody. Debate is good. Um, as long as it just stops, the moment it stops going from a debate into an attack, I don't tolerate that. Absolutely not at all. So I pull that back. So, um, yeah, so it kind of started off with that. And then obviously my messages, things I write resonate with my audience. It makes sense when I'm talking about people and I'm talking about for the handbook in the bin. You know, most people in HR go, oh, yes, I'd love to do that, Lace. I'd love to do that. Um, and maybe are not in the position to or for whatever reason. But um, 
that's why my posts do so well because it resonates with my audience. It wouldn't resonate if I had an audience full of, say, salespeople and marketing people, um, and you know, people who who work in retail. It wouldn't translate. Um, and so it's about you can grow your numbers, but grow them in a space that's right for your network. Otherwise, I mean, I don't sell anything on there. I have a coaching business, and I've never advertised it. And that sounds crazy in LinkedIn with my numbers that I could advertise it. I don't. I work on referrals um, because proof is in the pudding. Um, And but I don't need to, because the more this grows, the more people come to me and say, I really like your stuff. I really like your approach. I could really help with um, helping with business, helping with my confidence, helping with steering me in my career. Um, People come to me. So um, but that's all on the back end of doing the work now. Um, So my you know, my thing for people, I say to people, don't don't be afraid. You know, put your voice out there. Your LinkedIn profile is not the business's LinkedIn profile. That's you as an individual. You know, speak to your employer and say, I want to start posting some things. If there's anything you think I don't, you don't like or it doesn't quite, you know, sit with the values of the business, um, then let me know and I'll take it down. So nobody gets into trouble. But because it's LinkedIn and not Facebook and it's not dancing on the tables, I don't see what the problem is. Yeah, it's a bit strange in a way because... If you're a HR person and you're frightened of what you might post is going to affect the company, mm. then for me, that's the point to reflect on. Yes. But, again, <laughs> it comes, it, but it also comes back to people aren't, people are afraid to put their head over the parapet. It can be you know, Because if, if everybody doesn't agree with them, or what if my boss sees that and he doesn't like it? Or your boss isn't going to like that you say, burn the handbook. Well, then have a, again, go and have a conversation with your boss. I've had an idea. I think we should burn the handbook. And this is the reason why these are the benefits. And it comes back to what you said earlier. Absolutely spot on. It's about your influencing skills. Uh, the reason my one of you know my new employee who I joined on the 5th of October, which I'm super excited about, is um, we met on LinkedIn. She'd mm. already seen some of my stuff and then has continued to see it um, and likes that I'm so passionate about the topic and that fact I make a big noise in this space. Um, which is which is relevant um, and actually it's a strength for the business to have somebody who's so passionate about what what it is that we want to do um, rather than it's a detriment of oh um, you know she she comes off as a bit, bit over the top sometimes um, you know my personality I can't change that I'm not about to change who I am for anyone um, and you either get me or you don't and that's absolutely fine um, and I say that to people um, but the 50% who do get me get the full value of, of all of my passion And it's so important, especially for HR, because I think HR has a reputation of, you know, human remains and being robots, not really caring and empathising. So to see to see a leader being the complete opposite inside and outside of of work is so powerful. Yeah, and I just think there's so many more people out there who feel exactly the same thing, but they just aren't courageous enough to have that voice. Um, and again, the businesses I've worked with, where we've worked with CEOs who are people centric and we, you know, we focus on the people centricity in terms of leadership. Um, the results have been stunning, but it cannot be denied. Um, it's really, really powerful stuff. And, you know, who doesn't want to be part of that success story for sure? Mm, exactly. That's really cool. So I think so. I've been defining Mavericks as willfully independent people uh, from 2005. And I think you fit right in there. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Thank you very much. I um, my nickname is Pocket Rocket because I'm five foot tall and I do everything at four hundred miles an hour. Um, um, but to, to be called a maverick is is lovely because that's a much more polite way than the, what I describe myself, which is a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your living for the crazy because I mean that's not a maverick statement. I don't know what it is. Oh yeah, because. Again, for some people, um, you know, they like to go to work and they will work on a project or work on a plan and they'll deliver something. And and that's, you know, they start at the beginning and they finish at the end and it's fairly straightforward. A few bumps in and then it gets delivered and then they go on to the next one. Well, in sort of SME startup scale ups, that happens, but not often. You usually start something and then you're two weeks in and then they go, actually, do you know what? And I'm not, I am not going to use the word pivot because it's so overused right now. Yeah. It makes me bitch. Okay? So they just change course and they go, actually, I've decided let's do this instead. So the work that you've done up to that point, 
a lot of people go, oh, and they feel so demoralized. Oh, well, all of that work's gone into that. Whereas I'm the opposite. I'm like, okay, Ben, what are we doing now? And I'm like an excitable puppy because each time I have to rewrite something or change something, I learn something. And it's that crave for constantly trying to challenge my brain um, that I live for. So that's why, um, yeah, there's nothing that phases me. Um, and I am quite fearless as an individual anyway. I've come from a very adverse um, you know, start in life. So um, I believe in saying yes to everything, try most things once. Uh, if I don't like it, I don't do it again. But I live uh, for the opportunities and uh, that present themselves and I'm not afraid of anything. And I do speak to people. Um, again, I'm a public speaker and I speak to people about overcoming fear, what it is and how to overcome it. And actually, it's it's not what you think it is. And when you break it down to understand it, it means that you then go from being fearful to fearless and kind of end up doing a Thelma and Louise moment every time something new comes up and you go, yeah, let's just do it. Um, it's not right for everybody. And, and some people say I couldn't I couldn't do that and I couldn't live like that. But that's how I am. That's why I'm wired. And um, and I get the best of life and, and incredible opportunities as a result of that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm very much about getting people to not only be change ready, but kind of change hungry in a sense of, you know, one of the things I used to do with my HR teams and then obviously an extension to that into the leadership teams would be that if something has to change, it's the excitement of the change. So, you know, so you didn't go, oh, no, we have to change something. It'd be like, whoa, yes, this is brilliant. We can get to do this and let's try that. So that, you know, yeah, because totally. it's, especially now, I mean, you have to be able to do change all the time because life is change now. There's no other, there's nothing else. It's all about the change. And I say to people as well, when we talk about change, because, again, it's the cycle that everyone's living in right now. We did an exercise uh, with a colleague earlier, uh, just, you know, not long after lockdown happened um, and people were kind of very sort of panic stricken on a lot of things. Um, people aren't afraid of change. They're afraid of loss. They associate change with loss. So we did an exercise and said, OK, let's list everything that you've gained from lockdown and everything you've lost from lockdown. Now, with the exception of those who have lost family members through this pandemic, of course, um, on the whole, people have gained more than they've lost. But if you haven't stopped to think about it like that, people are still panicking about what they've lost and actually they've gained more. And whilst, yeah, I get people have, it's been difficult to be locked down and the effects of the two things I actually, you know, and they're quite serious things here, uh, the effects on people's mental health yeah, and the effects on people who have suffered, you know, physical abuse and that's been horrific and, and again i'm involved in charity who, who look after people uh, and support those um suffering right now uh, that you know for those type of people it has been horrendous and and i can't you know i won't mm. skip past that at all because not being able to get out and and not being able to go out and do the things that is good for your mental health but also being trapped in a house with an abuser and then physically not being able to go out has has been horrific for some people so there are exceptions to the rule and i'm, yeah. I'm not you know generalizing there um but in terms of overall people have you know gained more than they've lost um, but it, it, again that's why i've done an awful lot of support online for people uh, with mental health issues and for people who are suffering abuse simply because um you know there are help out there but everybody could do a little bit um, and again, I don't claim to be an expert in these areas, although I'm trained in mental health. I just think it's the right thing to do um, and get people help where you can. If you're in the position to be able to, even if you refer them to someone else, you know, the NHS have done a stunning job, um, but they're also under resourced. So, you know, the support they've got for mental health isn't as available. It's like a nine week waiting list and that's at no fault of their own. So if people like myself who are trained, who can come support people that just pick up the phone or contact us on LinkedIn, I'll always find the time because that's just the right thing to do as a human being to another human being. That's what you should do. Um, so, yeah. So, like I say, the whole change piece is really interesting, but that's really fundamentally what people people aren't afraid of change or afraid of loss. And that's why I say in the work environment where you say you worked on a project and they've done all this work, they feel they've lost their time, that they did the work rather than what are we going to gain by changing it? Actually, yeah. all of this amazing stuff over here that you and I live for. Others are like, oh, this is I couldn't do this. This is not comfortable for me. I don't live in the comfortable zone. That's right. And that's why it's so important to make sure you have 
the narrative and you know you do all the alignment and you do all the because uh, I think you're right a lot of people just do change as a transactional thing isn't it we need to move from there to yeah. there and this is how these are the steps we're doing it but they're not thinking about the emotions or the need to yeah. constantly communicate in a you know in a clear way not in HR speak and all this kind of stuff um, yeah it's, it's a you know it, it's a psychological cycle as well you know that and and again it's it's understanding the why when people understand why you want to change something you're going to have far more understanding that stops them getting into that panic zone of yes. then uh, and then denial and, and all of the all of the other stages but um but yes communication is critical um and i think you know in hr we should be you know huge advocacy of that because um you know we are trained in communication and lots of companies we talked last night on a on a uh, program i i uh, co-delivered with um, about communication how critical it is and I think a lot of people think they're good at it but very few are and there's and I did an exercise not last night actually but when when we when we're all together back in a room um I say you think good at communicating get a line of people and I will whisper something in the first person's ear and then get them to turn around and each person has to whisper it around the room I guarantee you by the time it gets to the end of the room okay what did Lisa say it is absolutely far from what I said in the first place um and so I said to people you need to learn to listen more really listen because not only it's not about what you say it's how it's received so you think you're communicating well but it's that you know it's the receiver how have they understood it how do they and if you put emotion into that then you're going to have uh, they're going to listen better they're going to you know it's going to make more sense to them um and you know builds deep trust and all of those lovely things but um just because you said it in the way that you said it doesn't mean that your audience has understood it and i think that's probably one of the key factors again in hr that we need to do better and help others do better on that as well i think that's totally true you know what i've only ever seen the chinese whispers work brilliantly once and it was very early on in my career and i worked in for a kind of national retailer and that particular store of about four, five hundred people was a rumour mill of toxic nastiness. Right? Mm. So yeah. uh, we were sitting down with the, the store manager and saying, what are we going to, what can we do quickly just like to start off this change? And we came up with the idea of doing a Chinese whispers for key information. Mm-hmm. And we gave people we had like five people who started off and they were the champions and then they had to tell five. But we made people really care about the quality of the information and made people feel special when they were one of the hubs that passed all the information. And by the end of the, the communication cycle, the actual message was the same as was the, it was amazing. It was like you never would have yeah. thought it was possible, but it was actually but it's because people cared and they felt special and they felt yeah. like that they owned it and it was really, you know, so they would tell it to somebody and then get the person to tell them back. And, make sure and that's the key. That's the absolute key. The importance yeah. of the message. So it wasn't, so you're right. So I think that kind of exercise is great to explain why it doesn't work, but, but because it was like, this is why it's really important. So they actually passed on the reasoning of the importance of the, of the clarity of the message when they passed on the message. Yeah, and I say, but you've absolutely got the answer there. Whereas you say to somebody, this is what you know, message is, tell it back to me, because then you know that they've understood it. And if they do then reciprocate, 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 then that's how it then stays together as one cohesive piece. And it ends up being the same message. But a lot of people don't do that. They go, OK, yeah. this is what we're doing as a company. This is what we want to do. This is the project, whatever it may be. And they kind of just blurb that out and they go, OK, right. Hands, hands together, clap. Well done. I've done that. I've done that. Right. What's next? It's like. You just created a train wreck, is what you've done. Um, they yeah. don't like the message, do you mean? So they're like, so then it becomes yeah. kind of like, well, I've been told to tell you this by my boss, and oh. I really don't agree with it, but it's they say it's important, <laughs> you know. So yeah. that's, <laughs> that's before they even got to the message, <laughs> so people are really discounting, aren't they? And then they pass on, my boss really hates this. He says something about this, <laughs> so it's like, yeah. it just gets worse and worse. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, when you, and and you just think, oh, so, so like say, so it was never going to be a winner. The moment that came out of somebody's mouth, of, I have to do this, but I'm really, you know, I'm not, really I've not got the buy-in. Or, so, I'm gonna, yeah, misery they, loves company, doesn't it? Or they love to give the message to marketing, 
So marketing, this is an internal communication and you need to internally communicate it, but you don't need to speak to HR because it's a marketing message. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Anything to the staff, I need to know what it is. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the, that's the thing because they say, oh, marketing is really good at communicating. Oh, yeah, they can polish a story and make it sound good, but that's not the same as making sure the actual message and, the, and what, the feeling of it gets delivered as well so that's oh, absolutely really funny so yeah. one of the, so we, one of the things i'm noticing a lot and and you kind of alluded to it is that right now hr people are losing their jobs hand over fist it's just scary in terms of you know i know hr always gets hit when there's a change but this time it's almost like a culling oh which is, absolutely it's frightening because you think you know who's going to do the work <laughs> when these people aren't there um so what can what can be done to to help a hr person that has lost their job um yeah. what, what would you suggest because it, it's it's quite tragic that almost every day there's another 10 people you personally know Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's heartbreaking right now. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, and I've been there very recently because I, I was um, six months in a 12 month contract in London um, and they were a recruitment based company. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so they overnight they they cut, you know, a lot of people and then reduced people's pay and then someone on yeah. furlough, etc. So they did what they needed to do. I have no I have no inbridge with that. They've done what they needed to do. But in terms of um and it's slightly different because it was a contract, but the same way as I still then found myself as somebody who pays the bills and pays the mortgage, uh, without a job. So um I did what everybody else does at the moment, which is you go on the job board, you start clicking. Well, in the beginning, you were lucky if there was 12 jobs that, that were worth clicking on in terms of everything just dried up overnight in the recruitment yeah. space. Um, so you panic and you go, OK, let me just stop clicking. And then um, and I have to. I have to kind of give a shout out here to, to somebody because um, I'd done that for a couple of weeks and was found I wasn't very successful. And also when on the job boards, you were 742. And it, and at Gosh. that point you go, wow. Point, yeah. yeah, that kind of wins you because you know it's going to be competitive, but you don't really understand the enormity of this scale of what's just hit literally three weeks in. Um, and uh, and I'm connected to a lady called Katrina Correa. I don't know if you know her. She's, oh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah okay so yeah, I love Katrina well. so uh, she's also a published author and and speaker so um and it was we'd only spoke a couple of times but I like her because she's straight down to business she's no bs she'll call it as it is no, um, a bit like myself so yeah so she um so she's my cup of tea when it comes to personality and it and actually it was a, a turning moment for me because she uh messaged on something and she said well no offense Lisa but you know, this is beige. Yeah, you know, your, your profile's beige. You're not beige. We've only spoken a couple of times, but I do know you're not beige. And you've got a huge network. What are you doing applying for jobs? Push your network. And although it was something that I absolutely knew to do at that point, because I was still in the fear uh, mm, in terms of scary. panic mode of, oh, gosh, you know, the world's gone its backside. How am I going to pay my bills? Yeah. Um, the same as everyone else. Um, it was a, a moment where the penny just stopped. I was like, of course. How stupid have I been? Because I couldn't see the wood for the trees because I was completely blinded at that point. Um, so I do have, uh, you know, I do have to say thank you to Katrina for that because at that moment it was like, oh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And then went off the next day and was like, I'm, and at that point I didn't apply for a job. I didn't, I stopped clicking. I didn't apply for anything. I got on the phone. I started networking. I started speaking to people. I started posting more, getting bigger engagement, um, you know, maybe dialing up the sass a little bit, um, there was a number of agencies who rang me and said, I haven't got anything right now, but let's find out about you because of this. And then there was a turning point where I, I'd got some number of interviews and took some of those. Um, and they were longer, even though they're obviously on Skype, there was like three and four, you know, versions of it and presentation. So it wasn't a quick thing to do uh, by any means. And it, and it felt like people were asking for more, um, you know, different things in the interview where they did before and I don't know whether that was because they felt they were missing something from the the face-to-face -face where you can pick up the vibe of somebody can't quite do that on video I don't know um but everything just seemed to be longer or six stages or five stages and some of it was just crazy um so 
Uh, so I went through that process, but obviously those interviews came from my network and people saying, actually, I really like you, what you're saying and, and everything else. And that's how I and connected with who I'm going to join now. Um, she's seen the stuff online and then said, I, you know, I like your passion, everything. And we got contacted. But I also then thought, OK, so this is good, but also other people will be doing this. I've got the, um, you know, I've got the benefit of having a huge network and, uh, you know, huge status on LinkedIn. So I made that work for me um, the same way as I spent a lot of time speaking to other people who had lost their job because I found that supporting each other that way was also good because it's hard for a lot of people. And it's it's easy to, to have a conversation with somebody who's in the same boat. Mm. who's not with your family who's not your friend who will give a different view so so take that um get that support you're supporting them they're supporting you um, and I think at this sort of time that's really important as well and of course they then have gone on to take jobs and remember who you are so then they're more likely to remember to scoop you up with them so there's yeah. a lot of value in that um and the same way as even though somebody's not got something right now uh keep in touch um when you apply for a job online, I say to people, well, you can go and click on the LinkedIn job, but do better than that. Go and find out the actual name of the recruiter. Go and get their email address. We've got Google. You know, it, it's amazing what you can do with, with 10 minutes of digging. So find their email address, um, email them. Um, and again, what I then did is took it to the, again, I say extremes. Um, I just like to call it innovation. Um, <laughs> is I got two previous CEOs I'd worked with and said, Hi, guys, how do you find, feel about doing a video testimonial? Video is really hot right now. And I like it because it, it, you know, you see it and you can feel it and the passion's there. Rather than when somebody rings up and says, can I have a reference? They will just say, here's the name, here's the title, here's the dates that were there. It's absolutely relevant and useless. It doesn't add value to anybody. It's another admin process we've always done. And it really needs to, another thing that just needs to be put in the bin. Um, so I got them to video. Um, and then my niece, who is a wonderful videographer, um, studying uh, as a student at the moment, I said, OK, uh, Auntie Lisa needs a hand. Can you sort this out for us? She's like, yeah, no worries. So thank you, Alex Dorian, for that. Bless you. Um, so she put together this montage of them talking about what I delivered, who I am and, and why people should want to engage with me. That was a hugely powerful piece and not been mm. done by anybody. It's not. I really... Um, thought I'd come on to something special and I get that not everybody is going to have the ability to do that but if you can uh, do it because again it was another thing that somebody had seen online and said um, innovation is one of our key values and you've just blown that out of the water let's have a conversation um, I ended up with four jobs in the end and had to choose um, and it was a privilege to be in the position to have wow. to do that um, but, but because I'd made a different noise um, because again by building the network um it meant that more people had visibility, more people could see. Um, and so, yeah, you know, Katrina was absolutely right, worked my network, and that's how I was successful in the end. Um, but I also respect that people don't have what I have right now, but make a start. I didn't have it overnight. It didn't click a switch, and, and I had lots of, you know, millions of views every time I post. Um, it takes work. It takes effort. You have to be consistent um, and, uh, and, you know, join other people that are like-minded so but you know start your first post start your first blog have an opinion about something get involved get engaged um and i suggest that people do more of that um than blindly click on you know a role and be number 700 they'll get nowhere um and it's just demoralizing and when you don't hear back and things like that and it starts to affect then your you know your own confidence and you think well Maybe I'm not very good at this anymore. And it's so easy to get into that space. So that's why I say get a, get a support buddy that's also been with there. Because whilst you'll get, you know, a bad day and you think I've applied for five jobs, I've applied for 15 jobs, I've heard nothing back. And you start to go, just maybe I'm rubbish. Maybe I should just retire. <laughs> um, you, know, you usually find that that other person says, oh, you've had a bad day, Lisa, it's absolutely fine. Da, 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 da. Um, and Zoe Dyson, again, I have to name drop her because she has been my little gem. Um, we had a conversation. She's as batty as I am. Uh, we got like a house on fire. So we kind of helped each other on the days where I think, do you know what, Zoe? I, I don't know if I can do this. I can't I get going. I'm exhausted. She's got, yeah, you can. We can do this, blah, blah, blah. And then I would do the same for her. So um, she's, she's been a little ray of sunshine. Um, and uh, so it's important that you find people that are, that are there for you as well. And then we've made great connections. We're going to we're going to hang out when all of this crazy is, is done um, and, and meet face to face. So, um, yeah. So I also have met some incredible people online, um, which, you know, I know will become firm friends for life. That is a, I absolutely know to be. 
Oh, sorry, that's that's fantastic. I totally agree. I mean, business people do, as I say, video testimonials, but I've never seen somebody in a corporate space get video testimonials. That is really innovative and makes so much sense. And, and I also agree with the whole get the profile sorted because, you know, if you're going to interview somebody when you're in your role, you, you check them out and you go to LinkedIn straight away. Yeah. <laughs> it's just standard, isn't it? So, mm -hmm. you know, so yeah. if you're looking for a job, then you must know that your your LinkedIn stuff needs to be needs to be right because you need, you do need to stand out now. Yeah, and I say when you're, you know, you are one of thousands of people. Um, what I've said to people is, OK, so let's just say you're in a pool right now and there's 5,000 HR managers. What's special about you? And when I say that, they kind of gasp and go, oh, at least that's harsh. No, I'm being hard for the right <laughs> reasons. What's special about you? Um, um, and you have to work on it with people. They yes, genuinely, right. it's like, well, you, you know, and then it's like, OK, so all right, that's amazing. Okay, this is incredible. I didn't know that. That's super interesting. Where is that? Where Where is that on your, any of your profile, any issue, anything? Uh, well, kind of, no, um, yeah, exactly. So let's let's go get some of that and then let's dial that bit up because that's where your superstar status is. Let's, let's go put some work into that corner there because that's the difference between you and everyone else. That's right. Uh, I, I tell you, I talk about that, you know, in the sense that you need proposition, you need a proposition story. I think it's quite interesting in the sense that as a HR professional, like one of the, one of the questions I used to always ask at the end of the interview, especially with people I liked, was why you? And the amount of, and the amount of times that that person has lost the job I wanted to give them because they went, I don't know, I'm nothing special, and they're like, and then you prod going, yeah, but you said this, and you know, you said yeah. you did this, and they're like, yeah, but I suppose the same everybody else. You're like, ugh. <laughs> but I say when we said about when we first start talking, people say about you because we live in the space where we ask everybody about themselves. We're not good at telling. See, again, that's where you know HR people are not good at doing their own PR. No, it's true. they have to learn how to market themselves better as individuals and as professionals and as experts in their own right. Because mm -hmm. let's face it, we look after people, recruitment. Uh, we're expected to be employment lawyers, uh, wellness advocates. You know, we we wear about ten hats a day. Um, and yet we're not classed as experts. Well, no offence. I always say to people, if you think you can do your job without HR, go try it. And yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> You'll call me before I'll need to call you. It's guaranteed because, you know, we are experts and people, you know, the businesses do benefit from having the right per people um, and they should be involved uh, in the business and how it runs, et cetera. Um, and a lot of it isn't. So um, there's so many people missing out on such... Um, and again, it comes back to good commercial sense. Um, but there's so many missing out just because they can't see it. They're blindsided by it. Yeah, I must admit, I do find it particularly satisfying mentoring HR people. Um, because, of the, as you said, there's a huge impact that can be made. Um, and it's uncovering it. And I think if you help people, especially at this stage, when they're in an organisation, then they'll be so much better at what they're doing. Because they've done yeah. all that sort of pre-work beforehand. Do you think that it's important that someone has a side hustle? Because one of the things I've noticed, like in the groups I've been in, and I say I just see a flood of HR people losing their jobs and panicking, and I say, is there anything that you can do in the meantime? Whilst you're, you know, here's some things that you could be doing now, but in the meantime, could you do some coaching? Could you, you know, what do you have that you could do? And they seem to be quite reluctant to look to to flex into a different area. Again, it's be I would say it's because, see, I live in both spaces. I live in, um, you know, where I have a permanent role. Um, and then I have a couple of things on the side, which are fun things to do that happen in the evenings that don't impact anything or anyone else. So it, it works. So I live in both worlds. I live. Yeah. Um, but in terms of getting somebody to go from a stable, safe environment that they feel at the moment, even though they've lost a job, if you just you know, mm. take that security piece, which is a huge piece for people, mm. um, into something where you're saying, well, you could go and do something else, but there's no guarantee. You know, you haven't got that 3,000 
plus salary a month guaranteed in your bank account. You have to go and be the person who delivers the coaching, for example. Uh, Plus you have to be sales, you have to be marketing, you have to be operations, you have to be advertising. Um, And those skills are very different to HR skills. So um, again, it comes back to if you don't know business and how it runs, then you'll struggle to run a business. And I also do, uh, again, I've got a number of HR consultancy um, mentor uh, teams because they are great at doing the coaching. They're great at teaching people. They're passionate about, uh, you know, understanding why people need their skills in that aspect. What they're not good at is actually getting new clients because they suffer with um, not being able to actually get the sale and get into market themselves. Because yeah. like I say, if you and I go onto LinkedIn now and we we typed in uh, coach, there's billions of them. There's mm. hundreds of thousands of people. And again, it comes back to, you know, okay, well, let's look about what's special about you, what's niche about you, what's your message, how... And when I say to them, okay, tell me as a client how you would talk to me. So you pretend you don't know me, put it out there and tell me who you are. And like I say, and, and what comes back, it's like, no. Would I buy from you? No, you just come across as the most irrelevant, lame, wet salmon I've ever met. <laughs> and there's no way. And they kind of go, oh, and I say, OK, so let's change that dialogue. Right. Try this on. And then they go, oh, yeah. Oh, and do you see what that does? That gives you this. It shows you that. And, and then we do a little kind of I, I take them through almost like a sales funnel, to be fair. Um, and then they get it and go, OK, so we'll try that. And I, every single one of them have done it and said, if I don't only know that in the beginning, I would be, you know, have way more clients simply because you're still running a business and you're coaching. And when you're just doing a one to one where it's just you, you're not only growing your own business, you're in your business and you are the business. So you have to learn the business skills for you to be successful. You can't just wake up next day and say, oh, I want to be a coach. So and then just got to start the coaching is just about talking to people. No, you have to. You have to feed the pipeline. You have to have people come into your business to be able to coach. And so that security blanket of having a set salary versus not, and then having to learn new skills to be able to move into a different space, people really struggle with. Yeah, I I think that this is the way it's going to be now, isn't it? I think, you know, children now and, 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 well, anybody now, really, it's a case of, if you are going to work in the office, you know, make sure you're still doing something on the side because there's no security in the office. Agreed. You know, you and I are from, you know, background where, um, you know, you had stability, mm. you had long term service awards and those sorts of things. And that's gone. There is, you know, whether people like it or not, um, the, you know, the forever job, it's done it's over and even if you have a permanent role it could end tomorrow so there is no security that there used to be that long service thing is is changed um because you know the environment's changed but not only that if you think about right now we've got four different generations of people within the workplace and you know the younger generation now they are more transient they're more transient so they don't buy mortgages because they don't want to put down roots because they'll go wherever the next career opportunity is and good for them a whole wide world out there go for it um so you know they won't be tied to mortgages they'll want to do rent for six months they they won't be tied down to an organization because they've been good for them it's about they understand that they want the fluid nature of what they do because they will stone hop to get where they want to get because they can get there faster and quicker and technology uh lends itself all to that very very well so um it makes it even harder for people when you're trying to retain your best talent knowing full well there's always going to be someone out there offering bigger and better and sexier so you've got to work harder to keep your best um and there's a no obviously you and i could talk for days on that one but <laughs> you know what I mean? but in terms of of you know the world has changed and, and the forever job doesn't exist anymore it, it's gone and people need to accept that and like you say um think about what if um because you know again there's a lot more you know startup businesses therefore they don't have the need for a, a full-time permanent hr member of staff in in you know in a team but what that means is they will want some consultancy they will want somebody two or three days a week they will want somebody a couple of hours a day um and that all lends itself sorry can you hear my dog (laughs) sorry um that all lends itself to um you know more consultancy and more people who are going out and doing their own thing um and like the you know 
not working for the same company all the time and having a, a different um, experience with the different companies that they they support. So um, yeah, there, there's so much opportunities out there, um, and and to say, and I think that will grow more and more. Um, I, I definitely think that market in in terms of HR support, external support, is growing. Yes. Uh, and it goes in cycles. You know, we've seen it where it was lots mm-hmm. of consultancy in the old days. Then it went back into in-house and now it's coming back out to, you know, as and when they need it. Um, and there are benefits and, and obviously um, of doing that in terms of costs. Sometimes I, I question that you lose the cohesiveness and, you know, the longer term view of the business, et cetera. So but there's a place for both is, is what I'm saying, uh, depending on the company. Yeah. So uh, there's so much to be gained and so much to be lost you know you have to work harder to get engagement and you know the care for the company with externals and, and all that sort of stuff but it's um, yeah. we're living in interesting times for sure <laughs> oh absolutely absolutely who could have predicted this right <laughs> exactly and what i'm finding now is a lot of people are, are being considered too old for for work at age 40 well, I'm 49. I'm about to be 50 in December. Um, so if you, if, if, yeah, so if somebody comes with a big stack of cash and says, put your feet up, Lee, so you go retire. I'm okay with that. They can throw that one in. But, um, <laughs> well, you've got your coaching I'd business see, too, I'd, though. See, I'd, I'd be bored. Um, I, I will be one of these people that soon say, you know, you have to work to some point and then put your feet up. I wouldn't know how to put my feet up. Um, I, I would be bored in, in three weeks. I'd be climbing the walls and have to go and do something. So uh, it does demonstrate um, that it does demonstrate if you're in a company and you, you know, are getting to, you know, regardless of age discrimination or everything else, but you're getting to 35, you need to be particularly shown as relevant. Yeah. Um, do you know what I mean? Because but isn't isn't that awful though? It is awful. I mean, I mean that's isn't that awful that age, that, like you say? <laughs> No, 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 do you know what I mean? It is awful that people sort of say, and and there's one guy I was speaking to, actually a sales director the other day, um, and he's 52 and he said, I'm really struggling. And and it's it's because there is, you know, his words were, they've got young whippersnappers out there, he said, and they're running rings around my list. Um, And I said, yes, but you have, they have youth on their side. You have experience, you have knowledge, you have a consistent uh, history of delivery. They don't. Their talk is cheap. You can walk the walk. Now flip that and go back out there and get fighting. Um, anyway, three days later, you said, right, I've done it. And you're right. And I've had a conversation and I own the conversation. And you reminded me who I am and I've nailed it and I've got a job. And I was like, I am so proud of you, man. Honestly, I was so chuffed for him. Um, because again, it's just that, you know, it's, it is hard. It does exist, though. It does exist. And I, and I do get it in all aspects of, of um, any sort of form of discrimination. And it just disgusts me. Because, you know, people shouldn't have a view one way or the other uh, because of age or any, anything at all. Um, People are talented. And, um, you know, I know 63-year-olds who are still working who have more energy than some of the teenagers I know. Um, So, you know, energy, focus, experience. um, I just think that if people think that, then they are missing out on so much talent. And you know what? That's sad on them. Uh, They'll never know what they missed. And it's such a shame. I see it as a deficit of leadership because quite often people, especially millennials, you know, in the, that age group, especially late millennials, you know, becoming leaders, but concerned about the age. So they're not being necessarily trained on how to lead. They have, you know, they're in flat organisations, they're leading people, that they see someone who's older who may remind them of their parents, Mm-hmm. And they don't, you know, and they, and then they don't understand how, I mean, because for me, when I, in my first summer job, my first Saturday job, I ended up being a supervisor in a retail organisation and I used to manage 60 year old people and I was 15, you know, and, yeah. it's, and it teaches you to, to understand, you know, what people have to offer and all this kind of stuff. And I think when I go to organisations to do uh, Maverick leadership programmes with them, what I'm, find, I'm finding that you've got like a group of millennials, which what do you think is about what 39 down to 25 ish? It's quite a span of individuals, um, but even so, they they never generally have gone for leadership training. They've never necessarily seen good leaders to aspire to. Yeah, 
and, they, and their organisations have suddenly become flat. So the organisation itself doesn't know how to deal with this kind of flat matrix way of doing things. So that when they see people who are older than them, they're automatically going, I can't manage that person because they'll tell me what to do. Yeah, but again, it comes back to insecurity. Um, exactly. So then they don't hire them either because they're like, oh, you've got 30 years experience for me. You'll just tell me what to do and I won't. I, I can't be important, you know, which yeah. is really tragic. But that's a lack of leadership and leadership understanding. Oh, absolutely. And like I say, but it's, a, you know, in the gig economy right now, you've got a, a number of, uh, you know, younger people who have not only started their own business, but have now started taking people on because their business is so successful. Um, and one of the guys I know is 23. Um, and when we talked about that, his biggest hang up was his age. And the reason why he thought he was struggling to get clients was because of the opposite way around. It's, well, I'm young, they won't take me seriously. Yeah. Um, and I said, listen, again, it comes back to you are 23. You have got a two million pound business. You are 23. I know, it's unbelievable. You've got five people under your belt. You are 23. <laughs> I said, at 23 years old, I said, I just started dating my, my husband. I said, I, I was still going and getting leather four days a week. There, there was no way I could have done anything like that. I know, it's crazy. At 23 years old, so stop thinking it's a bad thing and see it as your USP. I'm 23 and I'm totally rocking it. And oh my God, <laughs> amazing. Do you know what I mean? It's um, amazing. It's just so exciting too but again he takes what i say but then he also understands what he's good at and what he isn't good at so he then says okay so uh, yeah when it comes to managing people i don't know what i'm doing i don't know what i should do i don't know what good looks like so he's um mature enough to say so those are the things that i need to be developed in to get even better um wow. but again that, that takes a, a mature mind in, even in, a, in yeah. a younger body sort of thing um but yeah i just so proud of him because of that fact but it's again it's comes back to insecurity of i've done this i've been successful but i don't really feel that i deserve it quite yet yes. because it still doesn't feel real yes that's true i think this is a great place to stop but before i do so is there anything i should have asked you and you're sitting there going that stupid woman never asked me this question because this is your chance to tell me now <laughs> no i just do you know what i've almost forgot we're recording i've just had a lovely time <laughs> <laughs> that is a really good testament i love that yeah, it's just like, oh, I'm just having a cup of tea. I've got my Earl Grey in front of me. I'm enjoying myself, having a little chat with Judith. No, I've had a lovely time. <laughs> Brilliant. So will you come back again when you're not busy? Yes, I'd love to. Yeah, let's let's do some more things. Um, and uh, I'm doing a, a video. Um, oh, how would I put it? Um, I don't quite know what to call it yet, if I'm honest, Judith. So I'm doing a video piece where um, I'm being filmed behind the scenes which sounds really boring because there's not an awful lot happening right now in terms of we're all stuck in the house. Um, but obviously, because I'm involved in lots of different things, somebody said to me, um, you do so much that people have no idea about. So you should you should show people who you are more. Um, and so if you think I'm out there at the moment, Judith, hold on to your hat, my darling, because it's about to get a whole load worse. Um, and so we're doing a, a couple of video um, montages on stuff behind the scenes um and then i've also just agreed to last night speak to a hr director who who is absolutely brilliant in terms of his personality and we're kind of going to do a um a peter k uh, car share conversation oh my gosh <laughs> so that what we'll put probably a minute of that on linkedin it will have to be heavily edited and the rest will go on youtube but it will be for 18s over probably 25s over to be fair um so if somebody <laughs> wants to know how crazy it gets so yeah so you should come and do that once obviously we can we can do that but um yeah so there's lots of uh, other things again to and it's all around you know making a different noise having some fun loving what you do um you know hr people haven't got to be boring um, you know, we can have a personality, we can have a giggle. Um, you and I would have not spared our careers to this point, Judith, without having a great sense of humour. Mm -hmm. Some of the it's stuff true. we have to do with is really, <laughs> it's really um, you know, heartbreaking. You know, uh, two years ago, I had to make 140 people redundant. Now, you carry the burden, of, you carry the emotional yes, burden of that. Don't, I don't care what anybody says. You can't people don't ignore think that. you do that. You know, I think that's, I yeah. think that's, a, that's such a good point because I remember the first well I remember all the redundancies that you do but I remember the very first one and me and the manager you know 
it was a friend as well, you know, like a work friend of us. And then we did the thing and then we shut the door and we both just broke into tears and we just cried because it was just so hot, you know, it just, and then we kind of wiped the tears and like, then the next one, you know, and I think people, people think because you're outwardly professional, because you know, if you suddenly start crying, they'll start crying, you know, it's not helping anybody. Yeah. So you're out, you know, you're outwardly professional. People think it doesn't bother you. They don't think that you go home and you think about it and you worry about it and you worry about the individual and you, you know, I think they just think that, especially in HR, that you're like a robot that goes, right, and you think, well, yeah. I'll just do this press and here's a and like you don't care. And of course you care deeply, but you can't, you can't, you can't get emotional because it's not helpful to anybody for you to be helped to be emotional. Yeah, and, and like you say, so whilst, yes, we have to execute the difficult decisions of the business, it doesn't make it easy. And like yeah. I say, um, and that's why where humour comes in, it's not a laughing matter, but where they, where we get the old giggle in the job that somebody does something funny. And uh, for example, there was a, jan, uh, a guy that we had to have a word with um, and sort of say to him, oh, you know, he used to come to work pretty scruffy, pretty smelly. And so, you know, again, nobody likes to have a conversation of... No you know can you <laughs> but everybody comes to hr don't they, they go, yeah it's like seriously aren't you the manager you have a conversation <laughs> i'm not yes, doing right. these anymore <laughs> <laughs> but then we do we get landed with all of those so you go oh another one okay i'll, I'll have a word um and so you know so i had a word uh, as you do as, as politely as you can but the same way as, as you need to say to somebody that you need to freshen up and you need to tidy it up a little bit um and all of that lovely thing so so he came to work the next day wearing a suit or, or so somebody came, I came into my office and said, oh, uh, so-and-so uh, has come in today and he's wearing a suit. So I said, oh, oh, OK. I didn't expect him to wear a suit, but I'm glad that he's taken some feedback on. He said, it's no ordinary suit, Lisa. So I was like, oh. <laughs> and I could tell by the look on that person's face that this was not going to end well. I was like, oh, what, what's that then? So he said... I think you need to come and see it rather than describe it. And at that point, I thought, oh, what? So, of course, I was like, oh, here we go. Rolling of the eyes. Uh, goes down the corridor, goes into the office. And there he is. He is in a suit, Judith. He is in a suit. His suit is made of bubble wrap. Oh, my. He had designed a suit and bubble wrap. And he had nothing else on but the bubble wrap. <laughs> it's innovative, for sure. That must have been a great conversation. Um, and so, uh, you know, as a job, as a professional, this is the person that's like... And, and I just, I couldn't hold it in. I couldn't hold it in. And I just stood there and I looked him up and down. And, you know, what I should have done is, is been horrified, left the room and, and, you know, had a word. I couldn't, I couldn't move because at that point I couldn't hold it in. And I just burst out <laughs> laughing, which was awful of me, but I couldn't help it. You human after all. Yeah. And, and so I just burst out laughing. Then he said, he said, too much. And so I just looked at him and said, <laughs> Well, it's Not bubble enough. wrap. I said, you don't know why I'm laughing, do you? And he said, oh, because it's, it's funny, isn't it, Lisa? And I went, well, no, actually, it's not. It's actually offensive because we talked about it yesterday and I feel that you've taken it to, you've, you've belittled what we said and you haven't really taken it on board. I said, that's a serious side. I said, but right now, because you're covered in bubble wrap, I said, like anybody else, I just want to hold you and pop them. <laughs> you know, you know? <laughs> this thing where I could see myself running behind him and just hugging him to pop them um, and I was like yeah so I need to leave the room before but I be unprofessional and you need to go home and change and be back in an hour and I want that hour back otherwise don't come back at all and he's like yeah okay fair enough um, so, but you know you, you've got to there are some times where you just can't help it and you have to laugh because this it's so like yeah yeah but so you take the rough and the smooth uh, for sure um, enjoy the giggles while you can but I think your, your good humour gets you through the very difficult times um, and yeah. so like say you don't go home and you don't end up uh, taking all the stress and worry home which obviously then affects your mental health affects your family because of how you're you are around them and they have to deal with all of that um, so like you say it's important to remember that there are a lot of people losing jobs but the people that are saying to people that you know making people redundant it's not it's not easy for them to do that either so whilst it's not ideal and it's hurtful and people are afraid remember there's another person on the other end of that conversation they don't want to be the person to tell you that and they they are carrying that burden too so yeah yeah it's a good, good point. point brilliant thank you for that and hopefully you'll come back soon what we'll do in the next one then judith is you and i can share funny stories about hr stuff <laughs> oh dear i have to i have to do some severe editing <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Brilliant. Every HR person has a story that they, well, oh. not a, like well, there's a book that you can never write. Um, <laughs> I don't think anybody would ever believe you. It's like you're like there's this this thing happened and then this happened and then this happened and it's just like I didn't know you. <laughs> it's just yeah, I'm not sure. It, it can be aired though that's the problem <laughs> that's true yeah maybe that's an offline one okay, yeah, okay. yeah. I, i'm thinking though i don't think we could share that but yeah that's great thank you once again for tuning into the maverick paradox podcast i hope you have enjoyed listening to my conversation with lisa as much as i enjoyed having it if you are pathologically curious and would love to find out more about the maverick paradox then please subscribe to this podcast on one of the popular podcast platforms. Alternatively, you could explore our resources on Mavericks at maverickparadox.com or read the Maverick Paradox magazine. We publish frequently each week. If you subscribe, you will get our monthly newsletter. And let's not forget my book, The Maverick Paradox, The Secret Power Behind Successful Leaders. For those that love a good discussion, you could apply to join our exclusive Facebook group. And finally, if you would like to work with us or just interested in finding out more about the Maverick at work, check out our website, maverickparadox.co.uk. Mm-hmm.